Good day everyone, I am Rena Marie Dapat and today I'm going to tackle about connectionism theory. But first, let's talk about who is Edward L. Thorndike. Edward Lee Thorndike is an American pioneer in comparative psychology, was born in Lowell, Massachusetts in 1874 to the family of a Methodist minister. He became interested in the field of psychology after reading William James' Principles of Psychology, and after graduating from Wesleyan University, he enrolled at Harvard in order to study under James. He was born on August 31, 1874 in Williamsburg, Massachusetts, and died on August 9, 1949. He completed his Doctor of Psychology in 1898 in Columbia University. He was awarded the doctorate for his thesis, Animal Intelligence, an Experimental Study of the Associative Process in Animals, in which he concluded that the experimental approach is the only way to understand learning and establish his famous Law of Effect. Now let's talk about Connectionism Theory. Connectionism theory is the learning theory of Thorndike, represents the original S&R framework of behavioral psychology. Learning is the result of associations forming between stimuli and responses. Such associations or habits become strengthened or weakened by the nature and frequency of the S&R pairings. The paradigm for S&R theory was trial and error learning in which certain responses come to dominate others due to rewards. The hallmark of connectionism, like all behavioral theory, was that learning could be adequately explained without referring to any unobservable internal states. To understand this, let's look at a simple example. Imagine a person tells you to define the concept of a keto. When you hear the word, the set of neurons associated with it active automatically in your brain. The activation of this group of neurons spreads to others it's connected to. This may include neural patterns related to the words tea, coffee, or boil, leading you to define a kettle as a device that boils water to make tea and coffee. In Thorndike's view, Learning is the process of forming associations or bands, which he defined as the connections of a certain act with a certain situation and resultant pleasure. His work leading up to 1898 provided the beginning of an exact estimate of just what associations, simple and compound, an animal can form, how quickly he forms them, and how long he retains them. Thorndike's theory consists of three primary laws. The first law is the law of readiness. The law of readiness was intended to account for the motivational aspects of learning and was tightly coupled to the language of the science of neurology. This law states that learning can only take place when a student is ready to learn. When students feel ready, they learn more effectively and with greater satisfaction than when not ready. The second law is the law of exercise. The law of exercise had two parts, the law of use and the law of disuse. This law stated that connections grow stronger when used, where strength is defined as vigor and duration as well as the frequency of its making, and grow weaker when not used. This law is simple. The more a person practices something, the better he or she is able to retain that knowledge. The third law is the law of effect. The law of effect added to the law of exercise the notion that connections are strengthened only when the making of the connection results in a satisfying state of affairs and that they are weakened when the result is an annoying state of affairs. Learning is strengthened when associated with a pleasant or satisfying feeling. Learning is more likely to happen again in the future. Learning is weakened 
when associated with an unpleasant feeling become less likely for learning to occur again in the future. Learners will try to avoid it. These three laws were supplemented by five characteristics of learning. First is multiple response or varied reaction. When faced with a problem, an animal will try one response after another until it finds success. Second is set or attitude. The responses that an animal will try and the results that it will find satisfying depend largely on the animal's attitude or state at the time. Third is partial activity or prepotency of elements. Certain features of a situation may be proponent in determining a response than others and an animal is able to attend to critical elements and ignore less important ones. This ability to attend to parts of a situation makes possible response by analogy and learning through insight. The third one is the assimilation. Due to the assimilation of analogies between two stimuli, an animal will respond to a novel stimulus in the way it has previously responded to a similar stimulus. In Thorndike's words, to any situations which have no spatial original or acquired response of their own, the response made will be that which by original or acquired nature is connected with some situation which they resembled. The fifth one is the associative shifting. Associative shifting refers to the transfer of a response evoked by a given stimulus to an entirely different stimulus. Sixteen years after publishing his theory in the educational psychology series based on experiments with animals, Thorndike published 12 lectures that reported on experiments performed with human subjects between 1927 and 1930. The results of these experiments lead Thorndike to make some modifications to his law of connectionism. The first change was to qualify the law of exercise. It was shown that the law of exercise in and of itself does not cause learning, but is dependent upon the law of effect. The second change was to recast the relative importance of reward and punishment under the law of effect. Through a variety of experiments, Thorndike concluded that satisfiers and annoyers are not equal in their power to strengthen or weaken a connection, respectively. In addition of these two major changes to the law of exercise and the law of effect, Thorndike also began to explore four other factors of learning that might be viewed as precursors to cognitive learning research, which emerged in the decades that followed. They are summarized by Bower and Hilgard in 1981. First is the belonging nest. A connection between two units or ideas is more readily established if the subject perceives the two as belonging or going together. Second is the associative polarity. Connections act more easily in the direction in which they were formed than in the opposite direction. For example, if when learning German vocabulary, a person always tests themselves in the German to English direction. It is more difficult for them to give the German equivalent when prompted with an English word than to give the English word when prompted with a German equivalent. The third one is the stimulus identifiability. A situation is easy to connect to or respond to the extent that the situation is identifiable, distinctive, and distinguishable from others in a learning series. The fourth one is the response availability. The ease of forming connection is directly proportional to the ease with which the response required by the situation is summoned or executed. The principles of connectionism theory. First, learning requires both practice and rewards. Second, a series of S and R connections can be chained together if they belong to the same action sequence. Third, 
transfer of learning occurs because of previously encountered situations. Fourth, intelligence is a function of the number of connections learned. That would be all. Thank you.